being that sign again. Oh yes. <laughs> Legend, How you doing? Man. Yeah, good man. And you? Good. Hey, my good. man. Hi, Craig. How's it going? Whoa, that's high definition. That's great. <laughs> good. <laughs> Got there in the end. Sorry about yeah, the buddy. delay, guys. No worries, no man. Worries, man. We're glad we could. Glad we could do it, but it's uh, it's going to be such a good chat, my man. Yeah, How's it yes. going anyway? All good, all good. Just dropped the kids back at school for the first time since the holidays, so that's a relief. And uh, <laughs> catch up with some stuff I need to be doing now. Yeah, so holidays, you've got to keep them entertained. Exactly. It's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like. Okie dokie. Good morning, Nick Oshipchak. Thank you so much for joining us today on the Ridiculously Human podcast, bud. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Uh, cool, man. So, bud, it's uh, actually through a mutual friend of ours, uh, Jonathan Hazelden, although he likes to be called Johnny Rotten. He probably doesn't tell many people that. <laughs> but uh, we actually met at his wedding a, a few months ago, and um, he told me a little bit about you and your story, and we had a little bit of a chat. And then I was like, wow, man, you've got such an interesting story and then i was able to research you you know before this chat and um you know so it's really cool that we that we're having this opportunity man and uh yeah everything that you've done is really amazing but so so thanks yeah it's good to connect and uh, especially at such a special occasion and uh, yeah it's just funny how these things line up yeah mm. for sure man and actually which we'll get on to later on um you've got an amazing uh, cbd product which uh, which i've been actually using for the last uh, month or so now and it's uh it's really had like a profound effect on me i think you know and it's um you know we'll get onto it later on so it, it's a great product and uh, look forward to kind of just finding out more about that so um good to hear making me more calm my man <laughs> <laughs> oh, classic so but you're born in london to a polish father and uh, an American mother of English, German, Irish, and Serbian descent. So there's quite a good mix. How there, did you right? find that out? Uh, cheapers. I don't know, but we do some great research. So <laughs> I don't know how true all that is, but uh, it could be true. But um, my mum was born in America, but she only lived there for two years. And then, and then it was England after that. Okay. Classic. So she might have some of that other stuff in her. I'm not quite sure. But um, yeah, I'm curious to know where that info came from. <laughs> oh yeah, but it was definitely somewhere. I didn't. I promise you, I didn't just bring it out. <laughs> not just for storytelling. We're not trying to emphasize. It. <laughs> so, so, but you 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 were raised in South London. Uh, maybe you can kind of like take us back to your memories of like growing up in in South London. Yeah, it was. Um, it's not somewhere I'd want to raise my kids now, but it certainly. It gave me a lot of experiences and um, it was, uh, well, the first thing I think of is my school journey was, we're talking about secondary school now, it was quite long. It was an hour and a half each way and I could, because I used to have to go into central London and then back out of central London because my school was in a place called Kent, which is outside of London really. So that, I had lots of different routes I could take on how to get there and that just provided me with opportunity really and uh, the ability to see a lot of different places and you know I could get buses, trains, trams, walking, uh, mix it up. So a lot of my memories of growing up were formed around school really. Uh, I guess that's the same with most kids. It's not like I didn't really grow up playing with kids on the street, on the green, in the park. It wasn't that kind of area. So my friends were my school friends and uh, obviously most of the time spent going to school. Um, and then on the weekend, it was just, you know, I got a brother and a sister, so it was hanging out with the family. But um, yeah, when I go back to South London now, it's not really somewhere I particularly want to spend too long in, not knocking it. It's just not really what I'm uh, into these days. And obviously I've got kids now, so when I do take them back there I'm quite aware that I always want to know where they are and I'm just a little bit more <laughs> careful of keeping them a bit close to me just because there's so much more going on there's more people there's more cars and there's definitely a different uh, feel in the air in terms of safety and security so well yeah I mean that's, that's I mean I, I know exactly what you mean but I think I don't know. I think there's this different feeling in London, uh, you know, since I mean, I moved here 20 years ago and it's totally changed. I reckon it's, it's very edgy now. And 
yeah, you, you kind of almost want to get out, you know, and um, <laughs> yeah. And so, so what did your folks do? What, what were they doing when you were growing My up? My mum was a teacher, as was her mum um, in primary school. My dad was a bit of a handyman. So he was, he taught me a lot of skills, especially when it comes to like fixing things. So um, that came in handy a lot because I would build on that, you know, that's like the foundation. And then once you understand you can do most things yourself, then you, you continue learning more and more skills. Mm-hmm. And that came into play a lot uh, in business. But um, yeah, so my dad was, um, you know, out normal hours, nine to five kind of thing. And my mum was a teacher. So I got to see that side of things. Oh, cool, man. And, and you sort of based off that hands-on approach with your dad and stuff, it also sounds like at grammar school, you also enjoyed the arts already then at sort of a, at that, at that stage. Well, and, uh, actually... I was very much inclined to always do as little as I could get away with at school. And I picked <laughs> art because I thought that was by far going to be the easiest subject ever and uh, a complete easy, easy lesson just to not have to apply your mind. So and- I did, I was never even like into it. I never considered myself artistic or anything. When I was drawing and I used to draw faces when I was younger, I used to do it almost mathematically and I always thought to myself, I'm just cheating here because all I'm doing is I'm like measuring, okay, that's like one down, two across. And then I was just doing it like mathematically. And I thought this is an art, this is maths. And uh, I could get away with doing a good drawing, but I never did good on the other side of the art studies, which is uh, research and writing and history and all that. So no, it was only uh, 10 years after leaving school that I actually picked up the art for my own sake and because I enjoyed it and I wanted to create something. Mm. In retrospect, do you feel like that was sort of, sort of cheating if you look back on it? Uh, It wasn't cheating, but I didn't, I I didn't have, no one was explaining to me there was a correlation between the maths and the art and there's Mm. numbers in everything and there's these patterns and everything. If someone would have explained that to me, then it would have piqued my curiosity and I would have delved deeper into it. I'm not saying I regret anything or, um, you know, um, wish things were different, but um, now I recognize that it's not cheating. It's just, that's how my mind was working. It was spotting patterns and that could have been expanded upon. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. It's so many it's, different ways to do things. Yeah, yeah. exactly, yeah. exactly. It, it's interesting that you say that this is not like art or whatever, but literally this guy told me about this app this weekend. Um, it's called uh, Three Words or something like that is, is called the app, right? Or, or Three Blocks or something like that. So what this guy has done is he has divided the whole world into little squares, right? And he says, ba- and, and basically what it is, it's an app for location, right? So um, just using three words, like it, it can tell you exactly where you are in the world. Um, and it's been used to help people that have like, like really got seriously lost on like crazy adventures and to find kids that are missing and these sort of things. But so he's taken the whole world, he's divided up into equal squares and like and based on three squares and three words, they can tell exactly where your location is in the world. And it's just, you know, everything comes down to maths, I guess, in some sort of way. It's super fascinating. So what kind of, if let's say you were using the app now, what kind of words would you put in? No, no, you wouldn't. So what would, what would happen is you would put in your, you would like, it would uh, locate you where you are. And then what it would do, it would give you three words. And those three words are your location. So like if you download it now, wherever you ba- you're based in Oxfordshire, it would say, okay, this is your three words. This is exactly where you are now. And anyone can find you that knows those three words. What would the uh, examples of those words be? Oh, just, they, they're completely made up. So, but they're, they're all nice words. Like, I think it's a complete randomized thing. It must be, you know, so like, I forget mine was like, uh, happy lights i can't remember even whatever it was but but they're, they're, they're just nice words i think there's obviously they just randomize them somehow but uh, and they're always probably different so um you know what's the difference with that to like uh, 33 musgrave avenue <laughs> do you know no no, I mean? no it's i think it's much more accurate that's basically oh. what it is um so yeah it's it's amazing there's some great articles i, I can send you one after the chat uh and I'll put it in the show notes here, actually, uh, on BBC of, of kids that have been lost, that have been found um, using this app. And it's, it's quite incredible, actually. They, they literally, all police are saying that people should download this app now because it's, um, because it's that good. Hmm. Yeah. 
don't quite understand that, but I'll look into yeah, it. Yeah, cool. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Nick, uh, so you, you also at that sort of young age, you also started learning something else and you, and basically you were learning how to gamble a bit and you, and you sort of bet with other kids. Is that right? Yeah, that was a big part of my school years, gambling. Um, I loved it. Really, we, a lot of us loved it. And again, that was playing into my ability with numbers and maths and particular statistics and uh, analyzing, I guess, but also psychology and um, and it was a competitive environment. So this was a great way to compete and it was a great way to make a bit of money on the side. So uh, it was just, um, we were playing literally like four, six hours a day, every day we were at school and we'd stay behind after school, we'd play in the lunch, we'd skip lessons, we'd play before school and uh, gradually we would bet on anything obviously, but gradually it would evolve and hone in around poker. <laughs> That's crazy. Like what, what sort of numbers were you putting on these as kids? Well, there was like 500 quid in the pot quite a lot. Wow. And uh, so, yeah, those big numbers for when we were like 15 and um, everyone except me was working in the late local Sainsbury's and their monthly paycheck would be 300 quid. So that would give you a kind of idea on what we were willing to risk. Wow. That's fascinating, man. Um, so, and then I think in university, it sounds like you kind of, you took it a sort of step further and you're almost like gambling professionally. Well, I wouldn't necessarily say a step further, but I did continue the poker. But what happened was that was the start of the internet poker boom. And uh, everyone was launching these gambling uh, websites and offering promotions and everyone was getting involved and trying it out. So that was a way for me to continue making some money. Um, and I was playing Heads Up, which was a one-on-one -on -one version at Texas Hold'em. And, um, but slowly that was the beginning of the end for me because the love, it wasn't the same. When you're playing with someone, it's completely different to playing against the screen. And uh, mm. then it became just about the maths. And uh, it was like, I just felt like I might as well be a robot playing this algorithm mm. da, 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 for a few hours a day. It was uh, took the fun out of it for me. So part of the fun for you was like the body language and reading yeah. people and understanding yes. their, like their, their tells and things like that. Absolutely. Yeah. And the emotions and just, you know, controlling your own emotions as well as reading theirs and, and trying to get a reaction and all that stuff. The, the live scenario, the energy involved. Yeah. Did you, wow. did you feel like you could, you could basically maybe win more like in person than online because you yeah. understood those dynamics better? Yes, definitely. Yeah. It's, it's, it's powerful. And when you can tune into body language, um, it just gives you this other kind of dimension in understanding people, doesn't it? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And was that something that you were like just naturally attuned to, or was it something that you kind of had been maybe studying as well a little bit, like to recognize certain things, or did you just have this sort of natural? No, I think of... it was natural. But then when you add in the hours and hours and hours of experience, mm -hmm. then you uh, refine it. But definitely it was natural. I think different people are kind of born with different sensitivities to mm. the situation and uh, emotion and environment and uh, almost different awareness of their own self, which again makes you more aware of other people. So I think mm. I've always been that way inclined. Mm. It's fascinating. And uh, I suppose it, it, it played into uh, your life later on. So at university, you, you sort of joined a martial arts club and, and you soon, you actually won a national Kung Fu championship. Um, so what was that like? And had you always sort of been into the martial arts or been interested in them before that? Not really. So I had always, I remember when I was about 14 or 15 watching one of the big boxing matches um, so England's got quite a big history with heavyweight boxers or boxing in general, boxing in general. So one of the bouts I was watching were two of the best at the time in the world. It might have been Lennox Lewis or Frank Bruno or someone like that fighting for a world title. And I remember by round 12 or whatever, they were just so exhausted. They were literally just couldn't hold their hands <laughs> up and they were just like, really. it happens a lot um, in the heavyweights you know, by those rounds maybe less these days because they're more athletic mm. but either way you'll still see it occasionally 
and I remember just thinking, well, uh, I could, I would be good in that environment, in that situation, because look at these guys, they're the best in the world, and yet they're so tired, and their skills had gone out the window, it was literally just swing, you know, whatever you can put behind it, but I just remember thinking, I, I remember feeling that I had good reactions, so I could dodge, and uh, I had good hand-eye coordination, so I could hit a moving target, so that was the first time I thought of something along those lines, and then later I watched some kung fu film or read a kung fu book and i remember thinking wow this kung fu is different approach to what i'm seeing in the boxing because in the boxing even the winner was taking multiple multiple headshots and body shots and damage in the bout whereas the kung fu was talking about emphasizing hitting without being hit and i thought mm. this makes so much more sense and that you know if i was to do a martial art i definitely want to approach it from that angle and then, um, and then later, but really, at, I was playing football and tennis and swimming and that kind of stuff. And then age 16 to 18, I was kind of into drinking and the sport went out the window and I was just going out with the friends. And then when I was 18, I went to uni and I knew it was a bit of a turning point for me. I was like, right, am I going to just continue being a drinker or am I going to get back on a healthier path now and, uh, you know, get training again and let's put some of this talent to use. So I went to, uh, so I joined up a martial arts class at the Kung Fu at university. And then um, that was my first uh, taste of it. And I quickly fell in love with it and the training and the learning. And I gradually umped up the amount of times I was training a week. Hmm. And, and, and what do you, uh, like, what, what do you think are the benefits uh, for, for other people and, and in general of people taking up a martial art? Well, if you've never done any before, then there's gonna, it's going to give you so much stuff because it's going to enhance and enrich your life outside of the martial arts arena in every way, from giving you more energy, more focus, more confidence, more discipline, all of this stuff is going to just benefit you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and like, is there more to it? Like then just say like the, the physical side, what you're talking about now, is there more like the, the philosophical side to it too? Yeah. 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 Because what you're doing is you're learning how to manage or control or eliminate fear or your emotions in general. And, um, mm. Yeah, I mean, different schools will emphasize the spiritual aspects of, of training in different amounts, but certainly you can't help but notice some of it in play. And even uh, the camaraderie aspects and when you're training intensely around other humans, there's a bonding that's going on there and mm. you realize the similarities and, and you realize that you're, you're all going through the same stuff. And um, yeah, even like... Um, let's say Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, for example, you know, it's had a profound effect on many people's lives in a spiritual sense, just the simple act of when you come in the room, you greet everyone, you say hello, you make physical contact, you know, most people going through their daily lives, uh, let's say if they work in a city, there's very little physical contact. You might be surrounded by people, but they're isolated and they're lonely and they're not, they're not connecting on a deeper level. So martial arts uh, uh, that does that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, uh, it's like this, this great energy transfer, isn't it? You know, of yeah. things. And, and, and what you just touched on there is so like, it's so like topical with Craig and I this week, uh, we listened to this amazing podcast. This guy is called Zach Bush. Uh, he was on the ritual podcast and he was, he was talking about that. Everything is like a physical uh, is an energy transfer, right? But he also talked about touch and love and these sort of things. And he said, it's amazing how humans avoid almost touching each other and like kind of being in our presence, almost like awkward. He says, he, he's like, just the, um, the, you know, holding somebody's hand. He's like, that is so powerful. That is so like energetic and something, but we almost find it like kind of weird, you yeah. know, to do. And, um, yeah, it's kind of strange how, how we kind of become programmed like that. Don't you think? Yeah, I agree. It's incredibly powerful touch. And, uh, you know, let's say elderly people who are living on their own or whatever, that is something they are missing out on a lot is just touch. And um, my granny, she's still alive. She's 97, but uh, she's living up north now. But when she was down south, 
I used to take her as a young kid to the eye hospital because her eyes weren't working and every now and again she'd have to have a checkup. And I used to have to hold her hand through the tubes and walk in and guide her to the thing. And, you know, it was just, it was quite a powerful experience for a kid because I, I, I realised how crucial that us holding hands was just to help her get to, to the hospital. And um, even like pets, you know, anyone has pets, they understand the importance of touch. And uh, me in particular, I'm someone that need, if I don't get touch, then I notice it after a few days. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm different and I need it. So my wife, I need massages regularly from her <laughs> and <laughs> she understands that now. But, uh, you know, everyone's different, but touch is huge. Like babies, when they're born, they can't survive unless they have human contact. Mm, so yeah, that's it. Totally. It's interesting in my work, I'm a chiropractor and, uh, you know, you, you, people always, one of the first things people always ask me is like, isn't it weird to touch people? <laughs> you know, like literally that's like top three questions, you know? Yeah. And, and I'm like, no, that is like, sometimes you just put your hand on someone and you just, they, their whole, they just, their body just like relaxes just, yeah. and you, and you, you literally feel it and see it, you know? And, yeah. and, uh, and that's the, the power of it. If you have a little bit of intent behind what you're doing, it's, it is quite a powerful thing. And I think it's something that, yeah, I think like training like that, what you were doing is, it's in some level like teaching to, to have that transfer of energy in a, in a good way as well. But were you, were you competitive at this stage? Like, were you feeling competitive about the, the art of, of the Kung Fu and all that? Or, I mean, obviously you won the championship, but did you feel like this, I want to excel at this? Well, I was generally a competitive person, yes. When I got into martial arts and I did my first competition, what it did was open my eyes and I realized that, you know, when you haven't done something, you build up this image of your opponents or, or the skill or the level and you kind of almost uh, make yourself small and make that scenario big. But when I was in that environment, I saw that there was nothing that, um, there was nothing stopping me going towards the top if that's the direction I wanted to put my focus and energy in. So I did some of those and, and it all went well. And then it was time. I had one last one before leaving uni. And I said to myself, right, I'm going to win this one. I'm going to um, put all my focus in. I've never put this much focus in to a competition before. I'm going to put it all in. I'm going to win it. And then uh, I can move on to the, I wanted to go into MMA after that, which I saw as a bigger challenge and more realistic form of combat and uh, um, free a form of combat and a more almost scary uh, environment and arena so anyway so I won it and then after that something clicked and I, I just knew that you know I set that intention I put in the work and then I got the result so I can just apply this now to whatever I want to do and um, so yeah I guess I was competitive but you know uh, I'm not just competitiveness is quite common and um there's many ways there's many reasons behind why people are competitive so do you think you were like um extrinsically competitive or more intrinsically like like were you like a lot of people are competitive with themselves you know what i mean is that what really drove you or was it that that sort of outside competition too uh difficult to um work out now at that stage what I was thinking but certainly what I can say is now I don't care to compete with others I just have my own goals and uh, aspirations and stuff like that but I don't know at the time at that age how I was thinking and feeling yeah yeah and and, and so, so okay so let's just talk a little bit say about the fighting you went on to compete uh, in MMA which just for our, our listeners is mixed martial arts and then um, you were undefeated in that and, and then you went and you, you appeared on the Ultimate Fighter TV series, which is a, a massive, massive thing. Um, and then even bigger, you, you went to fight in the UFC. So like seriously, firstly, wow, like congratulations. That's, that's no, you know, there's no small feat whatsoever. That's amazing work. Um, but what was that whole trajectory and journey like for you? You know, is this, is, 
is it something you kind of at the start of it, you kind of set out like, cool, this is maybe going to be my goal or how did it kind of happen? Yeah, it was fast. And, um, I remember going to, there was a show in London called Cage Rage, which was just a London based MMA show. And I went to see it early on in my MMA training. So I was, hadn't turned pro yet. And I went to see it with one of my friends who I've been friends with since I was four. And he said to me afterwards, I went for during, when are you going to be on that show? And I said, uh, I'll probably be a couple of years. And then it turns out like after two years, I was, I was further ahead than that show. I was um, doing the <laughs> ultimate fighter or whatever. So I kind of had a clear vision in my mind at the time, it was all very logical. It was like, right, I could see my progression progression each week with my training. I, and I just extrapolated. I said, okay, if I'm here now and I'm next week, I'm going to be there. Then next year I'm going to be there. Next year I'm going to be there. And it was very clear in my mind and I just kept working and uh, the results kept coming. And what, and what was it like to, to say fight, say in the, in the UFC and be a professional fighter? Like, you know, there's us, we look at it, we're complete outsiders, you know, and it's a, it, it seems like it can only be super tough, but when you, when you're a fighter yourself, um, you know, maybe you can just simply explain that experience for us. Oh, well, it's just all a bit of a blur and a dream. And, uh, the main thing is that I always tell people is that I never set out to be a fighter and it was never my dream or goal to be the the UFC champion. So it was more just a case of, I wanted to keep developing my skills and uh, my mastery of the martial arts. And um, that was like the testing ground. But, uh, and I loved the lifestyle. That was the best thing for me was being able to hang out with cool people and train with them and, and have these shared uh, powerful experiences having been able to travel the world and having that paid for and then the downside for me was three or four times a year I had to fight and uh, <laughs> you know that that was that was the uh, the payoff so it was it was great up to a certain point and then then it then my heart wasn't in it anymore I'd kind of been in there long enough to get what I wanted originally to get from it, which was to just discover some stuff and experience some stuff. And then, it, and then, and then I was in there a few, it took me like, well, my exit happened the way it happened, but um, my heart wasn't in it at one point and then it was time to move on to something else. So though that transition period, maybe over 12 months or something, uh, like many transitions, uh, I don't know what I'm saying, but um, you lose a bit of faith, don't you? Like, you know, you kind of, I wasn't losing faith. I just, it's, it's that uncertainty of what's next. And, um, should I keep doing something, even if I'm not loving it just because it's easy lifestyle and I get paid mm -hmm. or should I chuck it in now, even though I've invested a lot of time and energy and people say I'm good and I, I'm mm -hmm. not, I'm not, I haven't peaked yet. I'm not near fulfilling my potential or should I just, go in a different direction and uh and i'm glad now that i did go in a different direction and i always pass that advice on to other people you know as soon as your heart is not in something just go and go and follow it where it is telling you to go but at the time you know first time you do something like that it's a bit uh could be scary or whatever mm, for sure oh, it's comfort zone and then yeah, yeah. There's head versus heart and these kinds of things yeah. but um i was wondering i always wonder like what is the role of aggression and, and, and in, in this kind of sport? I mean, I know a lot of it is, is obviously just technique and uh, training and hours and that, but do, do you need to sort of summon up a degree of aggression or do you try and keep that almost like to a minimum or, you know, maybe you can just tell us a little bit. Well, there's different that. ways of doing it. And if you look at the elite fighters, then I would probably say the majority are, adrenaline testosterone based fighters mm. or you could classify them as athletes but when i say athlete what i mean is durable powerful explosive and uh, like 
mentality of just going straight through a wall. Right. So on the one hand, you've got that kind of fighter. And that I would say is the majority of fighters. And I also would say that the majority of those are taking substances to keep them in that kind of frame of mind and, and that mm. state of physicality. Because it's not natural to have that for so long, especially past a certain age. You know, we've all all males when we're like 18 to 21, those kind of numbers. It can it can be 16, it can be 25. But that's when you're full of testosterone and maybe you've got a bit of aggression or anger or whatever, unresolved issues, whatever. You're using that as fuel when you're burning through it and it should be this transformative process taking place. But if you're someone that's been doing that for a decade or 15 or 20 years, then people are taking stuff to um, steroids and whatnot um, Mm. and it's not natural and it's going to have big, big problems and consequences later down the line. Mm. Then that's the majority. Then you've got a small chunk who are considering themselves real martial artists and they will, um, they will rely on technique and um, awareness and movement. Um, They are the fighters I like to watch. They are few and far between. I certainly consider myself one in that category and I never liked, I never considered myself an athlete and I never um, liked doing cardio training. So the, the long runs, the sprints, the rowing, stuff to make, you know, you've got to push hard for a long time. I found that so boring and I just struggled to motivate myself to do that. So I always focus on efficiency. So the way I saw it was I couldn't afford to have an adrenaline dump in a fight because I'd be screwed. And if you look at my fights, what happened was I only lost four fights. All of them were by decision or split decision. And um, I would be doing great in the first round, not so good in the second round, <laughs> bad in the third round. <laughs> Normally, that's what would happen. Yeah, exactly. So I didn't really have that. Well, you've got to remember, it, it was also a combination. Of, I was a clean athlete, so I didn't take any of these steroids. Yeah. That's going to have a huge, huge impact on your gas tank. Totally. So my, I tried to stay as calm as I could right from the get-go, like even... The whole build up to the fight, the day of the fight, I was trying to just stay as calm as possible because I, my attitude was I need to just stay calm and make my gas tank last as long as possible. I can't have any spikes in it. So uh, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> oh, yeah, totally. Yeah, it's really fascinating because like you said, like, you're obviously watching a fight to you, you know, it's hard to tell. Are they just like enraged, you know, like going crazy or are they just, is this all calculated? Um, it's, it's really interesting things. And, and so after you mentioned it, so you touched on it a moment ago, like after UFC, you actually took a break for, for five years and uh, you, you sort of touched on it. Now your heart wasn't in it. Um, but what did you do in those sort of five years? So I didn't take, so I switched to uh, Tai Chi, which is another martial art, but a completely different approach and way of training and mindset. So that's where my focus shifted to. And I, I just trained that every day and I traveled and I found teachers and that's still today what I train and I teach it myself. Um, so my martial skills on the one hand is still developing, but it's every day that goes by the, the side of me, which was interested in combat or competing uh, goes down and um so it's a martial art but a completely different approach to it it's more like the 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 mastery of fighting means you don't have to fight anymore kind of thing so mm. you're looking to transcend fighting altogether interesting and, and can you tell us more a little a little bit more about like um the meaning of tai chi and, and sort of maybe just describe it a little bit to to us well it's an ancient chinese taoist martial art um based very much on the philosophy of yin yang or duality and the study of nature. And you're just trying to harmonize with the principles of the universe. And um, you're trying to become more aware of the body, the mind, the spirit, how they can all harmonize, how um, you can flow and um, harmonize with the environment and um, just make the path more smooth and um it's basically about health and longevity rather than trying to get some short-term results and um 
instead of imposing your will and way on the world, it's more about harmonizing. Yeah. Once again, it seems to come down to this kind of like energy transfer and just kind of, you know, that, that sort of thing. But, but it's, it's amazing. Like, um, have you, you come across Wim Hof? I'm, I'm yeah. More than nice man. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, um, I did his 10 week, uh, breathing course, which is amazing. And, and one of the things that he, he does like during one of the weeks is he's like, cool, we're going to do like a bit of Tai Chi. I mean, I'm, I, I would totally butcher it, you know, but like, I don't know. He was like, we're, going like this and whatever you know like side to side and breathing and you do we literally did that for for 10 minutes oh my gosh I was knackered but I was like it was just so powerful you know getting the breath right focusing like pushing out you know like you could change it you could breathe out and push out or breathe in and push and then like push away or what you know and it was just like wow you could really like you said that harmony it was it was super powerful and um you know, I, I can only imagine that, that you've had great benefits and, and your students too. Yeah, yeah. So that, I would say that comes under the category of Qigong more than Tai Chi. Okay. Um, which is still energy work and it's amazing for health. Uh, tai Chi is slightly different, but it, it still incorporates the kind of stuff you, you're talking about. But yeah, certainly it's uh, had profound and powerful effects on my life and uh, hopefully those that I teach. And I, it again spreads out into all areas of my life. It's not just something I leave in the training hall or area, but it's, it influences my, with my study of Tai Chi, my understanding and awareness grows. And then that feeds into how I live my life. Mm. And, and Qigong and, and Tai Chi, there's, you mentioned there's like a sort of a similarity there. Um, have you have you done some training in that too? Is it totally yeah. separate, or do you touch on both? Or uh, it's very hard to actually put down in words what the difference between the two is. But I guess you would say that qigong is energy work, and it's primarily just for health. Whereas tai mm. chi is like this martial art system, which incorporates the qigong for health but it's also got some other objectives, which mm. it, it has systems for developing. Cool. I always think like, this is something that, that most people should take up, you know, not, not uh, just for the whole kind of peaceful element that it brings, you know, and better understanding like martial arts is just, uh, it's super powerful. Yeah, well, look how yoga has exploded the last few years in popularity. <clears throat> so many people are benefiting from that and um, that's going to give you in my opinion everything martial art can give you um, and I think as so you've got the, the wave of yoga and then uh, I think gradually awareness of Tai Chi is going to come in a bit more and people are going to want to explore and find out about that as well yeah for sure well, I can I'm super interested but definitely like I want to I want to kind of start exploring that side of things too because I just think there's there's so much benefit to it, definitely. Um, just before we move on with your with your story, like um, just to stay in the fighting part, like in in a strange way, a little bit. Do you find that because you've been this professional fighter, and like that you have maybe people that know that, do guys come up to you and challenge you, you know, because they were like want to prove something ever, or do you just no, be much don't. More better that, and then just don't even get in that situation? Okay. It's a good question. So first of all, I never got in fights, even when I was younger. So the energy you're putting out will determine what kind of reactions you attract to yourself. That's something very important for people to understand because it's not just to do with fighting, it's to do with all events in our lives. Whatever you're putting out, you get back. So people wonder why they're getting in fights every time. They're not looking at their own thoughts, intentions, behaviors. Second of all, I don't hang out in places where you're likely to get in altercations such as bars and cities. Um, I'm in a small town in the countryside, so it's safe. Thirdly, when imagine, imagine you were someone who was looking for a fight, you would be drawn towards picking on certain type of person. Now, it doesn't matter my height or weight, but my energy that I'm putting out, it's a calm, confident, 
energy. It's not the kind that someone would go for. So I've got a friend, he's called George Monkhouse. He lives in London. He's, I love this story because he, um, he was the person I first learned Qigong from when I was living in London. And um, he used to work in a bar and it was a bar in London. And he, before long, well, before he turned up, they used to have bouncers there. And when he started working there, because of his energy and the, his the vibe he was putting out, but also you, you have an awareness that comes with that, such as you can identify potential problems and deal with them before they ramp up. So mm. before long, they didn't need the bouncers anymore. He was just, he was playing the role of the bouncers even though he was behind the bar. Wow. So hopefully you get what I mean from that story. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's fascinating. It, it, it is it a mix back to your to your card playing as well you know just having that in a, that some people just have this deep awareness yeah and, and i like what you said about the calm confidence you know there's a certain uh feeling that that portrays and yeah it's yeah. Uh, and you get that I in mean, animals like, too mm. and um in fact one time when i was about early 20s i made my friends leave a bar because i told them a fight was about to happen but mm. they were all looking around and they couldn't see any signs of aggression but it was huh. something that I felt, I felt that energy because I'm used to being around that energy in the MMA environment and the arena. You, it starts and it boils and it bubbles up. And when alcohol is involved, no one is, mostly people are not aware of it. And second of all, yeah. no one's trying to diffuse it. People yeah. just get caught up in this mob mentality. So I said, I knew and it was time to leave. And, but they couldn't even see any signs of any aggression. Huh. And then it, it broke into a big fight? Well, I don't know. <laughs> but I, I've, I've learned to trust the instinct, you know, there's no, yeah, yeah. no yeah. point in what worst case scenario you've left the bar necessarily, but yeah. you know, mm. what, what could have happened? hundred percent. I've yeah. seen people have a glass put in the head. Mm. So it's, yeah. it's not worth that kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Bad. Yeah. The, 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 yes. I mean, alcohol, I don't know. It just, it, it kind of like, it just, distorts people's reality doesn't it a lot of the time and, and so much negative and bad stuff happens as a result of just yeah of of that kind of different level of where your brain is and then and, and lack of awareness and stuff and uh, yeah. yeah it's 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 interesting because i think i i haven't touched a drop for like over two years now and um even before that i'd really like cut down a hell of a lot and like going out now and not boozing, but being around people that are drunk, I'm like, wow, I used to be like this, you know what I mean? Like, and you don't realize until you're completely sober is like how kind of silly or stupid or just whatever people are when they, when they're drunk, you know, and you're like, ah, interesting. Like this stuff is, uh, <laughs> you know, you might have a lot of fun sometimes, but actually a lot of the time you're also just like behaving <laughs> stupidly. <laughs> yeah. uh, classic man. So, but you mentioned it a little bit earlier on, uh, you, you, did some arts in, in a levels, right. And, uh, there was like your, you know, in school still, and then you didn't touch, touch any art again or do any until 10 years later. Um, what prompted you to actually sort of start doing it again? Well, again, it was just a feeling that came from within to create, I guess, to put, yeah, to create. And, um, actually, so when I was 26, I did the ayahuasca experience mm, cool. and um, I, that opened me up to sacred geometry or seeing geometric patterns. So I guess that partly prompted me to start creating myself. I wanted to delve into that a bit more and try and understand it a bit more. Mm. Can you maybe tell us a little bit more about sacred geometry, please? Because it sounds fascinating. Well, I mean, you can you can go all the way down to the really simple, something as simple as a circle, a triangle, a square. And then you can layer these patterns up with each other and make them more and more complex. But um, generally, um, if you've heard of the term a mandala, for example, that would be an example of sacred geometry. Um, but uh, my understanding of it as a whole is these are recurring patterns found throughout nature from the very small to the very big. And, and you've mentioned before like Fibonacci and these sort of things, like uh, what, what, what does that actually mean and, and how does it kind of exist in, in the world? 
what does it i mean we can't really ascribe ascribe a meaning to it but um we can learn from it in some ways um fibonacci for example the golden spiral is when you're building the the next number by adding the two previous numbers so for example one and one make two one and two make three two and three make five and you keep building is there when everyone sees it they recognize it and it can be found um you can just google fibonacci in nature and you'll see many many examples whether it's from something really small or really big but um it's also considered like a ratio of beauty divine proportions so you'll it'll be built into the body it'll be built into architecture and we'll intuitively recognize something as beautiful if it kind of fits into those those patterns and ratios um so that is one quite well known sacred geometric pattern you've also got something called the flower of life which people are familiar with but there's many and um for me i think their point is it's what you can get from it is energy flows along paths and pathways so you can by learning the pathways you can understand energy more and then you can utilize that in your life what, what do you mean by pathways exactly sorry bud well let's say for example in the human body you have meridians and uh, energy will flow through the meridians in, and um, in in the earth you have they're called ley lines and the energy flows through ley lines and and any energy is moving, um, everything is moving. So is it a random movement or are there, are there patterns to the movement? This is for each person to um, ponder for themselves. But um, I believe there are these recurring patterns where an energy likes to move from. It could be Well, let's say you, if you map the movement of the planets or the stars or whatever, then you, you'll start to see some of these very familiar geometric patterns. It could be a, a five pointed star, for example, or whatever. So for me, that's telling us and pointing us and showing us that there's these recurring patterns. So that's what I mean by it. Okay, cool, cool. <laughs> so, and uh, yeah, the first time I came across them was like with, with music. Actually, it was like, and as you mentioned earlier, there's a certain beauty in these things, and and it's weird because you're just drawn to it, and you might go, "Wow, that song was incredible," and then then you find out later that the guy or the girl like used you know some kind of a Fibonacci number or whatever to construct yeah. the song. And exactly. you're just, like, just for some reason, you're just uh, attracted to these things. Yeah. Um, so. One of my favorite types of music is the sitar, which is an Indian string mm -hmm. instrument. Too, and that yeah. is built on just maths, sacred geometry uh, patterns and numbers. And they're just playing these patterns and it's mesmerizing. 100%. Yeah. <laughs> I always find it fascinating, Vlad, like how, so, so for example, in school, you know, you took art because you thought it would be easy, whatever. And a lot of people that actually take art, they, they take it because they're like, oh, I'm more creative. I don't really like these sort of analytical subjects like maths and science and whatnot. But actually, you know, in art, in music, there's so much mathematics that yeah. uh, you, you, but but yeah, you're not kind of aware, aware of it maybe, you know what I mean? Like it's just, it's really kind of this interesting, interesting thing that people take something to avoid it, but then there's actually so much of it in it. <laughs> yeah. You know, Gareth, we, we were kind of talking about this earlier as well. It's like, th there's so much overlap in, in, in things, right? So like the, the, the intuition you have with a good song might be the mathematics actually, uh, just the way you seeing it. And at the end of the day, it's all the same, isn't it? Like, it's just this flow of, of things that kind of, and you might have an inclination to view it in a sort of an artistic, let's say an inverted commas way. And someone else will go look at the beauty and the mathematics of it. And at the end of the day, it's the same story. And it's, that's the cool thing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's super cool, man. Like one, and I think this is it. And, and this is what, uh, you know, Nick is so in tune with like, all these things are actually so connected in the world. You know what I mean? And like, if we're aware of it, 
um, then it just starts making a lot more sense. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And um, yeah. that's super powerful. But but the the I guess the sad part is that people don't get to the stage. You know what I mean? Because they just they're so so worried about other things in the world. You know, and um, you know if we if we all could tune in that little bit more, it would be would be super awesome. That's for sure. So uh, and, yeah. and that's why um, it it. It's great that I'm now selling the plant medicine essentially, because that for me was a crucial and significant way to delve deeper into the interconnectedness of everything. So mm -hmm. to know that I am helping other people in some way feel that themselves is very fulfilling. Mm, definitely, bud. Um, yeah, yeah. So just just before we we also just you you your art now your art you actually. I mean, you're making a living from it. You have for a while. You, you're well, no, selling no, no. it. My, my living is coming now from the uh, hemp. Yeah, yeah. Company, but you did for a while, spirit. didn't you? Or not? No, I would never made a living from it. I, it. And that was never my goal when I was creating it. So I started my first, um, I call it my proper painting, but that doesn't make sense. But what I mean is that was the painting. It took me 100 hours. That was the first time I put a lot of, time and focus into a painting and try to make it as good as I could but it was my it was my first attempt that's it was my first attempt to put create a really incredible sacred geometry piece it's called heavenly city and I've got it on my kitchen wall now but that I, I painted that during a time when my wife was pregnant um, with our first child and I had no work really. I mean, I was just training and doing a bit of teaching. So I had a lot of free time and I wanted to get into something. So when the baby was born, I could sit next to the baby, still be creating, but still be near the baby. So that was the first time. And that was when I was like 28. Um, but yeah, I, I can't say I ever made a living from painting, no. <laughs> And uh, so, Nick, I mean, you, you, you mentioned a moment ago, like movement of energy and, and the flow of things. And you also speak a lot about just movement in general in life and, and in the body uh, and also the, the mind, body, spirit connection. Uh, why are these sort of things and practices so important uh, to you? Because what I found is life sucks when they go out of alignment and when they're in alignment, life is great. So once I became aware of that, I have to try and um, consciously maintain alignment and keep bringing things back into alignment because I want to enjoy my life. Mm -hmm. so, how, so, do you so, align, how do you align it? Sorry. Well, there's different ways, but you've got um, different systems which have been refined and passed down over the generations, which are, which are, created and refined for that very purpose. So for example, Tai Chi and yoga, they are systems of alignment and they bring everything into alignment and therefore union. So yoga means union. So when everything's aligned, it's one and everything is unites. Mm. How, how, how do you, um, how are people unaligned then? You know, is that, if that's a, well, let's say your yeah. thoughts and your actions don't align, they don't match up, then you're out of alignment. Mm. So if you're thinking one mm. thing, but doing another thing, then there's this discord, this is disharmony, and that's going to cause friction and tension and stress. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And the, the sort of just the spirituality side of things, right? That's a word I think is, even for myself, is, is maybe a little bit um, fraught with maybe a bit of toughness. I'm not sure like how to approach the word sometimes. How do you see um, sort of spirituality or mind, body, spirit in that sense okay so a lot of my understanding comes from the study of tai chi chuan and i've actually named my firstborn shen which means spirit or consciousness wow. um, but again these are just words but it's pointing towards something and for me it's what we are first and foremost is spirit which is the very uh, refined energy and then off of that uh, comes the mind and the body so the spirit is first and foremost so that if you if you train that or or maybe train is not the right word but if you almost honor that that we are spirit first and foremost and you know the trees spirit the earth is spirit the animals are spirit if you honor your spirit if you honor that everything has spirit 
then the rest is easier after that. Is this, is this source energy or, or like universal intelligence or is that something sort of that you see? Is that the way you see it in a way? I don't really try to label it too much. I mean, that's when you're going to go off you know, on tangents and you're going to like yeah. impose these ideas and fantasies and all this stuff. So I'm just, um, oh yeah, I don't really, I don't. Put so it's it, not from a religious perspective, let's no, put it that way. No, 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 yeah. no, no, no. Okay. In fact, the, so the, the, the primary text in Taoism, which is where Tai Chi comes from, so Tao means the way, and it's talking about the way of nature. And the very first opening line, it says, the Tao that can be named is not the true Tao. So what mm. that's pointing towards is you can't talk about it, you can't write it down, mm. because that's bringing it out of um, its domain, which is beyond time and space and you're bringing it down into a dualistic world mm. and then as soon as it's in the dualistic world it's no longer what it is originally it's essence anymore mm. so it's like it's, it's a paradox really where you can't you've got to let go of the logical mind's desire to label it and box yes. it into something categorize it so Makes so sense. how do you then teach somebody to it if you can't like you don't explain it you know it. what i mean you help open some doors. It's like you can't make a horse drink water. You just lead it to water. So you can just point and nudge and, um, and um, yeah, you, you, you can't um, give it. It's called a transmission art. There has to be a giver and a receiver. But um, and touch, coming back to touch, touch is mm. the main way throughout history that this stuff gets passed on is through touch because that's beyond almost the mind the brain's understanding of things is mm. is touching it's touching someone's core touching their spirit and i don't know yeah yeah um it's interesting the touch thing is very interesting actually um just sort of going back there a little bit because i i studied uh, to be a yoga teacher a lot a couple of years ago in india and uh one of the things that they say is like you must always ask somebody before you like you adjust them and I was like, that's kind of weird, you know, and they're like, yeah, because some people don't like being touched. Um, and it almost kind of doesn't go in line with actually what yoga is, you know what I mean? It's this kind of transfer of energy, helping somebody out get into the right position. And it's, uh, yeah, I guess it's interesting how we're all so different and some of us like to be touched, some of us don't. Yeah. I mean, that could have been a case of if you're learning in a yoga school, they, that's their way of... <clears throat> limiting any damage or liability uh you know if they're training up loads of teachers they don't want any people complaining about being touched inappropriately or whatever this is just uh, speculation but that mm. could be one reason i mean uh, every teacher has their own methods of passing on their art so you know yeah. i wouldn't say that's a, uh, a hard and fast rule that you got to ask everyone to uh, but, but, help them uh, with their alignment but each to their own yeah I mean, it is your, it is your, your space, your energetic space. And I suppose it's also not the end of the world to just beforehand is like, is it okay? You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so you can see it from that perspective as well. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And also like what you said earlier on, Nick, it's about like, it's about your energy and your presence too. You know what I mean? So if, if you are like calm, you can, people can sense that you, you're like a good person and these sort of things. They're probably just, they, they're going to be cool. Okay. I don't mind this guy touching me, you know, like obviously it's not inappropriate, you know? And then, so it's about your presence too. And I think maybe a lot of people are not, don't have that self-awareness of what their own presence is. And, and maybe some of them come across as CD, which is why people would, yeah. would not want them touching them. So yeah, super fascinating, man. But some people are kind of um, almost have been traumatized for whatever reason. And their way of dealing with this trauma is to go really deeply inside themselves. Think of a scared, hurt animal. And then when, when you go up to that animal on the street, he might, he might just automatically be in survival mode and think you're a threat for whatever reason. And he doesn't want to be touched. So it, it, you never know what's going on in the individual psyche, right. and how they are. But one thing I know for sure is, you know, in any healthy human then touches no big deal whatsoever it's um mm. it's, it's, a, it's a good thing 
yeah, yeah. That last line, definitely, but it's super true, man. Um, so, so you say that your life mission is empowering others through self-awareness and uh, to basically help facilitate positive change in as many people as, pos- as possible. Uh, how do you basically teach or cultivate self-awareness? That's a good question. And um, again, it's through the practices that have been handed down to us, whether it's meditation, yoga, Tai Chi. Um, I think the best, a great way to do it is through stillness and observation, removing outside stimuli and going inside and just observing and listening to what's actually going on. And um, because most people don't do that. And um, you're going to learn a lot from doing it. If you compare what you can gain from something you've never done before, and yet you've been around your whole life, suddenly paying attention to it versus trying to um, get something from the outside, which you've been trying to do for a long time. It's a no brainer to me. Mm, for sure. And, so, sorry, great. So, so, okay. but like, so, so to start that journey off, like say somebody, you know, somebody comes to you, they, they work, I don't know, in the city or, or in a stressful job and you can see that this person needs a little bit of help and they're, they're lacking the self-awareness. What is like a, a sort of practical, you know, first sort of week of things that you would give I would them? say just do standing practice. Now, most people never heard or come across standing practice in Tai Chi, uh, it's, it's, you have to stand in practice and very simply you stand. Now it's best if you have a teacher that can give you the key pointers on the physical alignment that you're after with standing. But even if you don't have that, you're still going to benefit from it. So you stand still in one place and stay there for five minutes minimum. If you can do 10, 15, 20, 25, even better, wow. but just by standing still, even uh, would be good if you could do it outside, maybe under a nice tree, peaceful area, and just stay there for five minutes and try and keep your awareness inside your body for the full duration. Obviously, it will wander, then that's fine. You bring it back in the body. Just by doing that, you're going to learn a lot. Hmm. And with your eyes open or closed? Eyes open. Eyes open. <laughs> it's interesting. There's some techniques out there when you, where you like neurological and, and, and like energetic techniques where you, watch someone just standing and and it's interesting how much you can tell like people might sway left or right they might lean forward and back but they can tell you quite a lot about how um like what's going on and, and sometimes when people are in a better alignment as you were speaking about there's a certain stability in the way that they're standing and it's it's quite fascinating actually but yeah so with with better standing alignment we're going to take the pressure off of the parts of the body which are not designed to bear load so for example, we're going to, um, everything is going to sink down towards the ground. It's going to improve our connection with the ground, the earth, our foundation. And the earth has a very, very powerful ability to balance us out. Because mm. when we get too much in the head, that's when things get a bit crazy. So we want to get down, lower down in our body and sink and harmonize with the earth. And does that involve like, like say being barefoot and, and that's you, can do, that. you yeah. can do that. You don't have to do that. Yeah, yeah. certainly if the floor is cold to your touch i wouldn't recommend it but if it's a warm place then yeah therefore it's great mm, cool man and so that's like energetically as well you, you you're grounding yourself and becoming humble almost is that is that kind of yes yes that's one of the things that will happen but um tree, trees have a lot to teach us when it comes to standing and just being and uh, obviously their roots go deep down connect with the ground but they're also growing up and out so they got it going on yeah we yeah. <laughs> massive fans of trees are like yeah it's, it's like they're just so exactly and, think yeah. how far out the branch you can go and they can be so heavy and they're just and they're still and uh, you can it's even insane. stand on them it's crazy <laughs> their strength yeah for it's sure bad, eh? <laughs> and like more and more like stuff's coming out about their intelligence as well like the communication and the like it's, it's almost like their roots are their, their brain is in the ground. They're opposite to us. And, and that's just like this crazy brain network under the ground. And yeah. Um, and they and support it, one another. They yeah. share with each other. 
It's yeah, insane, yeah. Right? Uh, there, there were that same podcast I mentioned earlier on. This guy was talking about literally about like soil and these sort of things and good bacteria. And they were doing this experiment in this piece of land that he owns, and they put like this really good soil and and soil bacteria in one part of it, and literally like I don't know a kilometer away or something. Eventually, over like a week or something the tests that they did, they were like, wow, this is kind of transferred from where it was to this other place. And it's just like, you're like, what? It's like, yeah. it's, it's, there's this, there's this whole other realm, which we, we literally don't know, you know, enough about it all yet. And then we started to explore. And I think that's, that's super exciting and fascinating. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's also like what he was talking about was, and, and we'll, we're going to come to that with, um, with sort of the, the next part of our chat about your, your products, but you know, the healing properties of plants have been sort of um, taken away from all these uh, weed killers and things like that. And, mm. and it's, it's like destroying some of the, the healing properties of the plants out there. And that's why it's so important to, to get the right stuff. So, but, but maybe, maybe let's just talk about that. So you, you know, geez, you've, you've really had a, a, a very varied and, and successful life. And, uh, and in 2017, you started selling your own range of organic CBD, uh, hemp-based health products. Um, so, so maybe just tell us what got you into it. And, and then you can tell us more about actually what you're doing, your business and your products. Yeah, so obviously the ayahuasca was a massive turning point in my life. And it was from that that I recognized how powerful plants are how much they can help us how much we can learn from them how much variety there is how much wisdom there is and um to be able to share that a little bit of that and pass it on is something which excites me and um as an athlete i mean i've i've been a cannabis user for many years and it's quite common amongst athletes, especially those in combat sports, because um, it's fantastic for health, essentially. And uh, it helps re recovery, repair, everything. So when I found out that CBD was this thing that was going to be allowed, and it was still cannabis, and it still helped, had such powerful healing uh, effects, I knew that that was the direction I... Uh... Before that, I... I was basically had very little money and um, had a kid and I, it had been a few years of basically living off the bread line, if you will. And that was the stage I had consciously put myself in because I was putting some of, of my theories of manifestation and abundance and uh, infinite to the test. And I wanted to really be on that, that, that razor's edge of living day to day not knowing kind of where the rent was being paid coming from and stuff like that so i needed that experience to um, put theories to test and build confidence in in what i was trying to understand but the whole time the pressure was building you know because my wife um well she was my fiance at the time she wanted to know where the money is coming from i keep telling <laughs> her don't worry don't worry it's coming it's coming it's coming this went on for like two years and I needed to pay for a wedding. I needed at some point to have a family house. So part of me knew that it was going to be fine, but I couldn't give her an actual answer of where it was coming from mm. or when it was coming. But then the day um, I was teaching a Tai Chi class and I had two people come in to join in and they worked on an organic hemp farm just half an hour down the road. And I said to them, do you do CBD? They said, yes. I said, can you do me CBD? They said, yes. And then I knew, okay, this is it. It's on. Wow. And then literally I just put crazy focus into getting stuff done because my, I knew, right. I want to have the best company. So straight away I made it organically certified. We were the first one to do that in the country. And I did this quickly and um, launched it. And then just continuously since there has been um, evolving and expanding so um yeah it's a health company a hemp based company we're not just going to do the food products and supplements but we're going to do hemp clothing hemp paper nice. hemp building materials everything hmm. that's super that's cool man and, and, and yeah you go craig guys go for it buddy yeah no no so so basically like how did you start researching this in the beginning like um yeah 
Well, I knew, I knew about plants. I know about plants. I know about cannabis from personal experience. So there wasn't that much research to do. All I needed to do was all the boring stuff like, okay, how do you become organically certified? Uh, what do you need to put on the label? What do you need to, how do you set up a uh, online um, e-commerce website? That's just reading. You can read up on anything on the internet. So it was just um, throw yourself in, super download, and then do it. Hmm. You make it sound yeah. easy, but but I think yeah. I think often no. people forget. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not uh, the the how to do it is easy. Yeah, but doing it is not always easy, mm. especially when you're working out of your flat and you've got the kids running around and all this stuff. But the, the, the theory of how to do things are easy and you don't need to know all of it. You just got to have the intention because you can never know all of it anyway. So you're going to always have these unexpected hurdles come up. But if you've got that clear vision and that strong intent, then you will find a way how to get through or over or around every hurdle that pops up. Mm, totally agree. Yeah. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, the, the, the hemp plant and why it's actually so dynamic. Obviously there's this, you know, it's to do with homeostasis and balance and it's bringing us back to connecting us with the earth which is what we were talking about earlier it's bringing us back on that wavelength of being united with everything around us and instead of being up in our heads which make us feel like uh, isolated lonely individuals and mm -hmm. we don't know what to do because we've lost the plot we don't know how we fit in with the bigger picture so it's all about being reconnecting with who we are and where we're from, and then uh, everything becomes easier after that. But, but but what about sorry, Craig? So what about the actual benefits of like say CBD, for example? Well, this is what this is what I'm saying. You take care of the spirit first, and then everything else falls into place. So you want examples of anxiety and depression and inflammation, blah blah blah. And I can list all that, and everyone's listing all that, and it's true, it works. But why does it work? It because it's bringing us back into balance overall. So I like to talk about that. I like to say, we're out of balance, we're out of whack. Let's get it back together. Let's, um, let's reconnect, let's, let's remember who we are. And then, uh, and then those little, they're, they're ailments which come later down the line. It's like a chiropractor, Craig. You must mm. have so many, you can just do something to the spine with one click and they're, their hand is better or their, yeah. you know, the leg is better because you know, the root of it. So you just treat the root. It is all, it is all linked exactly what you're saying. And, and more and more and more like stuff we've been talking about as well is when you, when you do go onto the deeper layer of, of connecting to the, to the, on an energetic level on, with these things, right. And, and the CBD for example is going to have a very powerful energetic thing to it. It's a plant medicine, as you said, that, that when that brings uh, it's gonna uh, the small the, the parts are when you add them up are bigger than than the the whole in a way it's just it gets there's this weird connection of things and and i totally get what you're saying is like um the one thing will affect the other thing that affects everything mm. um and and so but but so how did you come to this conclusion that cbd would be sort of uh, providing that which is quite a it's quite a deep sort of thing. Do you know what I mean? How did you come to that because, being the way through? Because this the CBD is from the cannabis plant and hemp is cannabis plant. And if you look at hemp, you look at how amazing it is from the, from how it grows to what its uses are, to what its benefits are from the stalk and the stem to the seeds, to the flowers, every part of it, from the way it's growing around the world, the way it grows quickly, um, and then the relationship and the history with humans and hemp, then it's a no brainer. Um, it grows all around the world. We've thousands of years, we've had a relationship with it. There's even this co-evolution theory, which talks about hemp has helped humans evolve. Mm. Humans have helped hemp evolve humans have helped it evolve by spreading it. And um, <clears throat> yeah, when I think of the problems humans are suffering, it's because they have, they've gotten trapped in their heads and uh, become too identified with their egos. And so the quickest way to sort this out is to reconnect with the earth and um, hemp does that.
Hmm. And the 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 um the the hemp itself is as you said there's been a long relationship but there's there's some like back in the day it was literally just once again an, a story of like one or two people that said no we want to have cotton becoming more popular so then it be sort of became less popular for a while um meanwhile it's been with with tribes and people for hundreds of thousands or however long thousands of years um do you know anything about that whole like suppression I, of like I, I know a lot about that stuff but i don't like to talk about it and i'll tell you why because yeah. i just been to a hemp expo for example mm. in uh two weekends ago and i gave a talk there it was about cbd and hemp in sport and most of the talks are about the history of hemp and they're educating mm. about it and it's great and then you've got the few people they're talking about the suppression of cannabis or hemp and they're talking about the big pharmaceutical companies blocking it and the government and then you get into all this stuff i don't really want to be putting my time into that side of things if it's all on the internet we've got loads of information about uh history and uses and benefits on our website but um yeah as i said there's just people doing that already um mm. but yeah all, all i can say is cotton is one thing hemp far superior Paper mm. from trees is one thing. Paper from hemp, far superior. I can't give you... If I tell you anything about the reason why it's come about that way, that um, hemp is not currently being used instead of cotton for most clothing, and why hemp is not being used for paper instead of trees, that's just going to be my opinion. It's not necessarily totally. facts. There's lots of... Re I don't know the ultimate reason why that is, why things are the way they are. All I can say is hemp is offering a much, much better alternative and gradually people are going to make the switch and it's going to benefit humans and it's going to benefit the environment. It offer, it obviously like fires you up a little bit because you know what I mean? Like, like people are probably I'm saying a lot up, of bullshit. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, I, I just don't, um, I don't want to, I'm someone that doesn't like to repeat themselves too much and I don't want to be beating this drum about, you know, mm. when you're, when, when you're in an in, 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 in sorry in an industry, then you're talking about the things and they're talking about the things, and then you kind of you talked about it for so long mm. that I, I I'm not one of these people that can uh, campaign and just go on a on the road and just say the same thing to loads of different people to help spread a message. Mm. I just find that inefficient way of doing things. So my passion is um, hemp and plants. And I'm trying to like almost cut through the nonsense. Like if you, if you just spend five minutes on Google reading through one list of the different uses and benefits of hemp, then you're going to be an instant convert. It's, unless you've got these really strong attachments to your old ideas and opinions, then you're just going to realize that hemp is um, superior to these alternatives and you're going to be excited about it. And we're going to want to, learn more get involved more with it so but nick just to kind of like um just to kind of like maybe give it a different perspective a little bit right so somebody like yourself right you 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 understand this super well right M most people don't actually so so the world needs teachers okay you know what i mean and guys that are really passionate really understand it like properly like yourself the world actually needs people like you to explain these things to you know say myself or craig or, or anybody else like you know why this stuff is good stuff for it to to become more mainstream do you know what i mean so like so we do need people to actually sometimes, even though it seems like a bit monotonous, do you know what I mean? To do it. We yeah. do kind of need like guys, especially like you that are passionate, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, like to spread the good news uh, and, and the good uses of it. Yeah. 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 Okay. So basically, um, well, it sounds like, you know, most about it already. Um, you know, hemp can grow in like a hundred days from seed shoot up 100 days then you can use every part of the plant if you're going to make textile it's going to be stronger and durable than cotton you don't have to chop down trees it's going to be naturally antibacterial if you make paper from it you don't have to chop down uh sorry I was, uh, if, you, if you make paper from it you don't have to chop down trees we need trees 
we've got we've got we're chopping down too many trees it's causing a lot of knock-on effects negative effects mm. from the water to lots of things so um you're gonna to have to ask me a more specific question no about no, 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 no no i wasn't I, it wasn't about i, I was just saying I, i'm not asking you for more details now that's for sure but i was just saying like it's uh people like you that that know it so much we do actually need teachers do you know what i mean so um i think it's uh it's just an important thing um yeah it's just yeah, just yeah. A, just an observation do you know what i mean on my on my side <laughs> because maybe, uh, maybe I'm, th- yeah maybe i'm fighting against that role um to be a spokesperson for hemp because it's not something i really want to do but uh, i am passionate about it and i i guess like it's more uh, yeah, it's just a different way. I, I guess I see things. I, I, I am a very strong believer in we're coming back to energy movement. I see hemp growing in the collective consciousness. It's inevitable. It will happen. It's not a case of there has to be spokesmen talking about it. Mm. It things certain things are inevitable. They're gonna just happen, and mm. the way they unfold and happen can happen in a variety of ways. So I'm just going to keep doing my thing, knowing that that is going to unfold. But there's also going to be some people whose role it will be to be spokespeople for these things and get it out there. I just don't see myself necessarily as that person. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. no, that's cool, man. <laughs> but definitely energetically, you're putting out a good vibe for it. So like you can just feel like that. this is a passion for you. And look, through passion, that that's the same as like teaching your energy work or your tai chi or these things that it doesn't have to be through words there can be other means yeah. and, and, and yeah, just absolutely. that just like showing rather than telling if you know what i mean and, and absolutely that's, absolutely that's pretty and cool i like too. to think the quality of our products will be doing that but even the logo i use um, a taoist symbol it's the bao gua it's called it means eight trigrams i put that on my lo- that's my logo and that's that's doing very powerful stuff behind the scenes just because it's, it's going into people's awareness subconsciously. That's proper sacred geometry. And, it, and so that's more my method of doing things. Yeah. yeah. No, well, it's, it's funny because when Gareth first like showed me this stuff, I was the first thing I said to him, I was like, but the, the labeling and the, the, the picture, you know, like I, I didn't know, but it had stuck in my mind. So yeah, it's working, man. <laughs> There's a lot of wisdom in that logo. You, you want to read up a little bit about it. And uh, it's very, very um, old. And um, yeah. it's, it's eight trigrams. And then if you stack, there's eight. And if you stack any one of them on top of another one, you've got 64 combinations. Now, this is, relates to something called the Book of I Ching or the Book of Changes in China, which has massively shaped their whole culture from medicine to society, everything. Hmm. Oh, man. That's Amazing. fascinating. And talking about the power of, of plants, I mean, you, you touched on it earlier. Um, you, had a, you, you went to an ayahuasca ceremony and it sort of turned you on to a lot of the stuff that you, you're doing now. What was the... Did you do it with an intent uh, or, or was it something you kind of were drawn well, to? I can't remember what my intent was now, but all, all I can remember about it, because this was quite, this was um, a few years ago now before it got popular and everyone's talking about it. And you, if I were to do it for the first time today, I'd approach it slightly differently. But when I did it, I wasn't really sure what was going on. All I know is the person I went with, he explained it as any questions you have, you can have answered. So that's what got me interested. And um, so I can't remember what my intent was. I just remember being very curious and I wanted to see all, if that was true and what it was all about. Hmm. Fascinating. And uh, did you like, did you experience the normal experience of what people do with ayahuasca when, they, when they're sick and like hallucinating and these sort of things? Well, I didn't, I wasn't sick and <laughs> um, I partly theorized that is because one, I did the fasting like you were supposed to. Mm. And two, I, from, I think fast, uh, that when you're purging, it's a process of eliminating a lot of stuff from your system. And I think my martial arts training and pushing myself very hard uh, on a clean diet 
was my own way of doing that over the years. So I feel like maybe there was less that needed to come out, but these are mm. just degrees. Mm. Yeah, it's a fascinating experience. I, I mean, I did it years ago uh, in the Amazon jungle in Peru, and it was like, wow, it was uh, it was an amazing experience. I don't know what it answered for me at the time, um, but uh, but it was, it was something I definitely like to go back and do again now that I have a bit more sort of knowledge. Do you know what I mean? And um, yeah, really amazing stuff. So, so just kind of moving on a little bit, but, uh, we, we, we've spoken, we've touched on these things, but you have a mindful movement program as well. Um, can you just tell us like what it is and what's the importance of, of movement? It's basically Tai Chi, but I just call it mindful movements because most people will have a preconceived idea of something when they hear the words Tai Chi. So it's like just a way of getting people to try something new but ultimately i'm just teaching tai chi okay amazing and there's a, there's a thing called spinal wave movements like w what are the benefits of that that is um all that's really doing is it's not even something i've ever taught um that's just showing a simple way we should all be able to articulate our spine if it's loose flexible strong so it's nothing advanced, it's, um, it's nothing uh, magical, it's just, guys, you've got a spine, this is, what, this is the kind of thing you should be able to do with it, uh, and probably most people can't do it because large chunks of their spine have seized up, and mm. they're, not, they're, not, um, they're not keeping it loose and taking it through its range of motions every day. Mm. That's for sure. I think what, what, what a lot of people don't realize is that your, your spine is actually like a, a turbine. It's a, a generator for, for energy in the body and actually specifically the brain. It's, it's a feedback loop for the brain. And, and that's, so that's one reason. And the other reason is that flow of the, of the fluid around the brain and the spinal cord is essential to having a healthy brain. And, and, you know, and by yeah. doing a spinal wave can actually pump that sort of fluid around so there's at least like two like very practical reasons to do it as well and as like you said just move a little bit <laughs> it's exactly ridiculous. exactly the first thing i try and uh, get healthy in uh, someone is their spine and then then you can work from there hmm. yeah. you Agreed. guys are definitely speaking the same language <laughs> that's <for> sure. <laughs> yeah. so, so what is your what are some of your big lessons that you've taken from being a pro sportsman You learn how, I was thinking about this just the other day. I used to train intensely for, let's say, four hours in a day. So there's not many, and we're talking high output. We're talking like sweating and being knackered, really knackered at the end of the day, and then having to wake up the next day and do it again. <clears throat> so although business is hard, it's not, it cannot compare to the intensity and the amount of physical output that came with being a professional martial artist. So therefore, things seem easier. And I just think I'd, if I've got to work, put out a little bit of physical effort for eight hours or 10 hours, it's easy compared to doing intense. Even a, if, you, if you have to do... A, the most intense training for 20 minutes, right? It's, it's so difficult. You'd rather do eight hours of low output. <laughs> if, you're, if you're talking just in terms of what's more comfortable. Mm, okay? yeah. I, you, could, you could argue that, oh, I'd rather just get it done in 20 minutes. That's fine. But what I'm saying is if you're capable of doing hardcore maximum output for 20 minutes, then it's easy to do eight or 10 or 12 hours of gradual output. So the main mm -hmm. thing I got was a big tank of energy that I could put into other areas of my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a powerful lesson to learn, but that's it's a that's a great one. It's it's in, it's an interesting takeaway as well. You know what I mean? Like other people would think would be some other lessons from being this pro sportsman, but that's a, that's that's just a sign of you once again seeing the world differently. I feel, you know, and it's, uh, and that's very, very powerful and um, a great lesson for other people to look for these other lessons. And it doesn't always have to be what you think it's the obvious things. It's, it's actually this other layer deeper of things of learning, you know? Um, so talking about 
lessons. Um, you, you say that your, your son Shen is like one of your greatest teachers and there's some really cool videos of you doing some amazing like acrobatics with him, like on, uh, uh, you know, on his, on your feet and stuff. I watched those. It was really cool. So, but why do you feel that, uh, you know, your son is your, your best teacher? Well, I I have three sons now. Three, wow, cool. Congrats, yeah, man. thank you. So I don't know if I can still say he's my best teacher. Maybe I have to say they are my best teacher. <laughs> but kids are being born more open. They are born with complete openness. And I think something we struggle with as adults is remaining open and seeing things with new eyes and seeing the possibility and the beauty in all things. So I try and be inspired and almost see, try and, uh, yeah, just, I can see my son Shen in particular is just the most um, positive and enthusiastic person. It's a bit of a problem for me and my wife because we can't match his energy. We're <laughs> always telling him to be quiet and calm down and all this stuff and go to bed. He doesn't need to sleep much. <laughs> It's it just a uh, crazy energy. So it's very inspiring. And um, I just, I think most parents make the mistake of thinking they know more than their kids and they should tell their kids stuff. Whereas I'm taking the opposite approach and I'm thinking the kids actually know more than us, not necessarily in practical terms, like how to do the washing up, but in the way they see the world and the way they interact and approach with the world. So I try and, uh, mm take as much as I can from, from them. Yeah. Great Congrats. lesson that, but definitely. And yeah. that curiosity that they have, you know, like, yeah, I don't know. It's like almost drummed out of us as an, by the time we be, we reach adulthood and just seeing them being so curious and like interested in little things. You're like, why am I not doing that? That's cool. You know? Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's also like, it, it kind of reminds me of what you were saying earlier is you're very much in this, in this, um, sort of vein of uh, observation and uh, looking and listening and uh, saying less, doing more. And then I guess you, you were just watching your kids and they and just seeing what they have to teach instead of like thinking, you know, better. And that's just a great lesson just in general. And uh, you're transferring it from one sort of aspect of your life to the others. And I think it's a great, really great take home actually. So what are, what are some of the things you're excited about, about going into the future and uh, what have you got coming up and, and uh, tell us a bit more about that and then maybe also where people can contact you and, and find more about you and your products. Well, I'm very busy at the moment with the Ray Spirit hemp brand and um, because the timing is so good, the market is exploding, the industry is exploding and we position ourselves as you know, the highest quality stuff with the, the good reputation so constantly i'm every week being uh, exposed to these new opportunities to connect with other big companies and take my products into new directions so that's exciting for some i personally someone that gets bored quickly if i'm just doing the same thing over and over again but now i've got lots of new projects on the go i've got too, almost too many to juggle with so i have to try and pick ones which say yes to some say no to so like after this interview i'm going to teach tai chi and then i'm going to go see some new premises for the business so um, we need new premises everything's expanding always you know every year we're just whatever premises i get now i'm sure next year i'm gonna have to get some more so things are always expanding this is exciting for me um, because it's new territory and mm -hmm. um, I'm just excited because not only am I enjoying it, but I know it's doing a, a lot of good for people and for the environment. So I'm just going to focus on this for the next few years. Mm. Epic, man. Wow. Really exciting. And then how can people get in touch with you? You just want to give us like your web? Raisespirit.com. Yeah. Yeah. Raise Spirit. Um, maybe you could put a link to that somewhere just yeah. so they know how to spell it. And then that's, that's the main Core. once you go there you can see everything okay amazing Beautiful. yeah uh, we put links and show notes and everything there as well but and uh yeah man it's uh it's it's, it's amazing what you're doing and like i said I've, I've been using your products for uh at least a month now 
uh, myself and my missus, and we, we have your CBD oil, which we take uh, every single morning and every single evening. And um, I really think that it has helped, helped me just kind of um, be much more kind of relaxed in many situations. At the moment, we're going through a ton of change. Like we're, we're leaving the UK very soon. We're, we're packing up 20 years of stuff. Um, we, we, we're moving countries and all these sort of things. And, and that can sometimes be overwhelming. But I, I really think that this is helping me just sort of be more in tune and actually kind of enjoy the process and, and that stuff. And then um, I also love having the, the cacao uh, CB, uh, coconut oil, CBD coconut oil in my oats uh, most mornings. And it's, uh, it's really, really great. So um, your products are top class. Um, well done, but it's really, um, it's, it's really a great product for sure. So I'm really looking forward to seeing where it goes, man. Um, thank you. Thank you. It's good to hear it's, uh, it's being enjoyed in your household. Yeah, definitely. But definitely. So, so, but our last question, um, is what does being ridiculously human mean to you? Um, it means multiple things. So one of the things is it's ridiculous kind of if you could write down the thoughts in any one of our brains over a 24-hour period and then you look back at them you would say most of them are ridiculous and it also points towards the uniqueness that we're in the situation we're in as humans and what makes us different from other species in that we have this unlimited potential to take our lives in whatever directions we choose and to cultivate skills or awareness in any direction. There's no limit except the ones we impose on ourselves. Hmm. So I think it just depends where you're looking at, from what angle you're looking at that question. And, um, it's like this juxtaposition and paradox between on the one hand, we are so powerful and and then, and, and how there's no limit on where we want to go and what we want to do with our lives and time here. And on the other hand, it's ridiculous that we don't always make the best choices and we waste a lot of time and um, we are trapped in this fancy and drama in our head of our own making which is really uh, putting the brakes on us and our development. So yeah, that's how I, I see it. Yeah. yeah. Very true. powerful answer, but yeah, man, it's so true. And thanks so man. Thanks a lot for that. It's a, it's a, it's a deep thought for sure. Um, so, but I just wanted to say like massive thanks seriously for, for coming on our podcast. Um, your, your story is, is fascinating. Um, I, I love everything that you you've done. You know what I mean? There's this, it really kind of like gives other people permission to, to just explore their own lives and to try different things. You know what I mean? Don't be afraid to kind of change paths and try different things and test yourself and challenge yourself because that's where the learning really happens. And you're also massively humble, right? In terms of like how you tell your story and what you do. And I love um, the way you do it. Like, you, 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 you lead by action, right? You don't, you're not a, a person that has to be loud or, or say a lot of things. Uh, your actions kind of will, will lead like in a positive way. And I think this is a great thing for other people to, to, to do as well. You know what I mean? You don't have to be this like really charismatic, boisterous out there type of person. If you just do good deeds and you do things the right way, other people are going to want to be part of that. And, and that is very powerful you know, and, and this is something that you, this energy that you have, and, and it's very, very obvious, especially if you're in tune with it, you know, so um, well done for everything you've done, man, and, and the way you do it too, it's really inspiring, I love how you, you speak about your kids, and um, you know, your, your business, and your products, and just, just everything overall, so um, thanks for, I'm super glad that we, that we connected at Johnny's wedding and, and thanks so much for your time, but it really means a lot to us and just wishing you all the, the success, uh, moving forward, my man. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me and, uh, those kind words and, uh, yeah, it's been nice talking to you both today. Yeah. Cheers, man. Thanks, and just real briefly from my side, man, uh, I couldn't agree more with what Gareth said. 
uh, you're very connected. Like that's the word that just kept coming through you, you on a deeper level. You know, you, you're seeing things from a, from a real deeper level. And I think that's where the, the real value is in life. When people can get down to that, that real humble and, and deep layer of, uh, of like not of like energy and spirituality and the interconnectedness of us all and, and, and all things. Um, I think that's where some real magic happens and um, you have a lot of knowledge that you are very thoughtful about. And I think that's like, I really appreciate that you, you, you're not just uh, because you have the knowledge, you're not just willy nilly with it. You're like you're very thoughtful about doing things. And I think that's a lesson we can also all take is take a moment to, to think how and, and why you share what you do share. And, uh, so that makes, that made me think a lot about it at the very least. So, so thanks a lot about for that as well. And, and yeah, I just, uh, I wish Australia would come along and so we could just get to your CBD here. Um, <laughs> because, uh, it's about time. <laughs> I've had a few people from Australia ask me. Yeah. So that's going to happen eventually. I'm sure. Right. Well, I'll be, I'll be, you know, blowing that trumpet for you a hundred percent. Thank you. <laughs> cool. Right, buddy. Cool, cool man, man. cool, bud. You. Thanks a lot, bud. Let's. Uh... Breaking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour, and up in the air. Stop at the toll, digging.